very much welcome to uh, the Institute of International Affairs. We have a guest this afternoon who has been with us a number of times. Uh, Bruce Stokes is Director of uh, Global Economic Attitudes at Pew Research Center. And uh, he has uh, major links with uh, international institutions such as Chatham House and um, others, but he is uh, a friend of ours and we are very happy to have him with us. Thank you for coming. It isn't like we need storms uh, in, uh, in um, Houston to remind us how dangerous the world is. But the fact that uh, we are having Harvey and Irma and maybe Jose coming, I, HJ, reminds us of the fact that um, global warming is not just an idea. It is something that is based in reality, and reality is based in the analysis of facts. And I don't know, uh, Bruce, if what you're bringing is facts. Opinion polling is not necessarily <laughs> facts, but it's at least a real attempt to understand what people are thinking and where we are going. And where we are going, we do not know, but we have to be guided by some understanding of, uh, by some evidence of what, where we are. So I'm very happy to have you here once again, Bruce. You're a regular, you're a friend of our institute. Come again, but please offer our colleagues here an understanding of where we are, and we take it from there. Thank you, Mats, and uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, uh, and I thank you all for uh, coming out here this afternoon. I don't hope I don't ruin your Friday afternoon, and your weekend, um, but I appreciate you taking the time uh, to uh, let me share with you uh, some of the results of uh, public opinion uh, surveys we do uh, in the United States and, uh, and Europe uh, to try to uh, better understand uh, at least the mood of publics on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and maybe some of the implications of that. Um, the we in this case is the, the Pew Research Center. Uh, we're based in Washington. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, for the last 16 years, we've been surveying around the world. Um, uh, we're nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-advocacy, uh, which means I always like to joke that um, I can tell you we discovered one plus one plus one, but I can't tell you it equals three. <laughs> You'll have to make that interpretation yourself. Um, we're funded by the Pew Charitable Trust, which is one of those wonderful old American foundations uh, who, uh, you know, uh, believes in, in uh, public policy and in public dialogue. Uh, most importantly, the reason they fund us is they believe that good public policy flows from good information. Now, as Matt suggested, that's a pretty quaint idea these days. Uh, but we firmly believe that good public policy requires good information. And so we do public opinion research. Increasingly, we do big data research. All of this is available on our website. All of it is free, but most importantly, it's searchable. So if you ever have a few moments and go to the website, you might find some fascinating things about views of religion around the world or social trends or views on science. Uh, I always like to say, if you want to know whether the Kenyans believe in gay marriage, we've actually asked them. You know, So there's a lot of interesting data there on political issues, but also a lot of uh, social issues as well. Um, this data that I'm gonna share with you is based on some surveys we've done this year in the US and in Europe, um, uh, done by telephone for the most part, only in a couple of countries is it done face-to-face. -face. 
um, uh, and to answer the one methodological question that always comes up, yes, we call cell phones. In fact, 70% of our calls are to cell phones, which is what you have to do these days in uh, public opinion uh, research. Um, and uh, I would give you a piece of advice when you deal with, res with public opinion, because Matt was, was making a you know, sly kind of commentary on public opinion. Um, public opinion pollsters are only as good as their last survey, right? And the British pollsters are not doing pretty good. Well, because of some mistakes they've made, uh, there's a lot of talk about polling in the United States. How come they thought Clinton was going to win and when Trump won? Well, in fact, the national polls in the United States were right. Uh, the national public opinion polls said that she would win a, about three more percent of the of the uh, two to three percent more of the popular vote than he did, and in fact, she did. Uh, it's just that we have this thing called the Electoral College, and and that is how we really determine our elections. And uh, he won the states he needed to win to win the election, even though he only got forty seven percent of the votes. So. Uh, but, but I would be the first to acknowledge that public opinion research is both an art and a science. The science is how you design the survey, and that's why we spend an awful lot of money trying to get it right. The art is how you write the questions and how you interpret the answers. So I think that, that uh, um, public opinion is a useful contribution to our understanding of reality, but it is only a contribution. It is not, not reality necessarily. And, and I think we just have to factor this in to our understanding of what's going on and helping us try to understand, obviously, a very complex and changing world. Um, the context of public opinion is often seen as views of the economy. Both Europeans and Americans now feel better about their economy than they have in years. Uh, we both now feel better about the economy than we have at any time since the financial crisis. This should make things easier politically. You can decide for yourself whether it has or not, but uh, I think uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is a useful sign that people are feeling better about the, and they should. The economies are doing a little better, especially in the United States. Um, when we ask people in Europe and the United States about international major threats to their country, um, basically we tend to agree on most things. Uh, we're a little bit more worried about cyber attacks from other countries than Europeans are. Uh, we're more worried about China than, uh, than you are. Uh, but you're worried more about climate change than we are. So, but we all are kind of worried roughly about the same uh, things. Uh, it is interesting that 30%, 31% of Europeans are worried about America's power and influence in the world uh, uh, and see that as a threat. Uh, but thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll move right along here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, we ask Americans, uh, uh, what's more important to the United States, Europe or Asia? And for the most part, Americans think Europe is more important. Um, so that's, I think, a positive sign about transatlantic relations. Uh, I would warn you, though, that when you delve into the demographics of these answers, it's old people like me who think Europe's more important. Young people, millennials, think Asia's more important. So this number's probably going to change as my generation dies off and millennials, you know, and, that, and the generation that follows them uh, uh, become a uh, larger and larger portion of the population. Uh, this is actually a Eurobarometer survey question that just came out. Basically, Americans uh, have a positive view of the European Union. Um, uh, and there's not a whole lot of demographic difference there. Older people like le are less positive than younger people. Again, it's very good for the European Union that young Americans feel so positively about the European Union. I would caution you... I don't know that Americans know much about the European Union. <laughs> uh, when when uh, this, a follow-up question was asked by the Eurobarometer on this about various aspects of the European Union, people didn't think, Americans didn't think very much about any of these aspects, which suggested they really didn't know much about the European Union. Uh, but in principle, they have a positive view. Um, 
We ask uh, Europeans and people all over the world every year about their uh, their view of the United States. Do they have a favorable or unfavorable view of the United States? Um, uh, notice that uh, the Poles and the Hungarians and the Italians have a pretty favorable view of the United States. Uh, less than half the Swedes today have a very favorable view of the United States. Uh, and the Germans and the Spanish and the Dutch in particular have a pretty negative view of, of the U.S. Um, I'll show you in a minute how that attitude has changed over time. Um, um, the, uh, every year, we ask people not only about their views of the United States, but also their views of the U.S. president. They have confidence in the U.S. president. And we've been asking that question for... 16 years. So we have a lot of trend data, which is, I think, uh, fairly illuminating, uh, because we believe that views of the U.S. and views of the U.S. president are kind of intertwined. And I can tell you, if you graph it over time, they tend to follow each other, uh, you know, a difference from one administration to the next, but they tend to follow each other. Um, this is the change in views towards the United States in one year in Europe. Notice that in Sweden, the favorable view of the United States has fallen 24 percentage points in one year. Uh, only 45% of Swedes now have a favorable view. It used to be 69%. Uh, it's fallen roughly comparably in Germany and the Netherlands, actually a little bit more in Spain. Uh, notice the one country in Europe where the view of the United States has actually improved very dramatically in one year. Who would have thunk it, right? It's Russia. Um, now, only 41% of Russians have a favorable view of the United States, but it used to be 15%. So in one year, it's changed uh, dramatically. Um, young Europeans have a more favorable view toward the United States than older Europeans. Uh, and it's a fairly substantial generational difference. Uh, so, uh, just as young Americans are more likely to say Europe's more important, uh, Asia's more important to the U.S. than, than older Americans say that, um, in this case, young Europeans are more likely to say that America's, uh, they have a more favorable view of America than, than older, uh, uh, Europeans. So that, that would potentially be a positive sign for, uh, uh, uh for U.S., European relations, because the next generation is fairly positively disposed uh, towards the United States. It, you know, it, it differs by country. There was not, by the way, a statistically significant difference in Sweden, uh, which means that roughly all the generations were within a few percentage points of each other. So these are just where you had a statistically significant difference. This, in my mind, is probably the most interesting uh, graphic from our current or most recent survey. This begins in 2001, as you can see, and there's a kind of a steady erosion in a number of European countries of uh, uh, confidence in the U.S. president. This is, a, this is a graph of the confidence in U.S. president. Then in 2009, confidence shot up in a number of European countries. You know, it bumped along up there. It went down a little bit. It went back up in Spain. It went down a little bit in Germany. It went back up in Germany. But it stayed fairly high. And then it dropped precipitously this year uh, with the election of Donald Trump. I didn't think about this, but when I showed this to a, um, a senior official in the chancellery in Berlin, he looked at it and said, oh, isn't that interesting? It took Bush eight years to get to that point. It took Trump two months. Uh, but this is, I think, you know, a fairly dramatic uh, re visual presentation of what's, what's gone on in terms of Europeans' views or confidence in the U.S. president. Um, but to give it to you just a, 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 by the numbers, look at the change in Sweden in one year there has been an 83 percentage point drop in confidence in the U.S. president from the last year of the Obama administration to the first year of the Trump administration. Um, you don't get those changes like that in public opinion very often. Um, a 75 percentage point drop in Germany. Um, 
uh, 35% drop in Poland. Uh, and remember, I remember the, the polls actually still have a favorable view of the United States, but, but have totally lost confidence in the U.S. president. So there, these, are, these are very striking numbers. Um, not uh, surprisingly, I think, um, not surprisingly, uh, if you are a partisan of one of the populist right-wing parties in Europe, if you say you have a favorable view of one of the right-wing parties in Europe, you are much more likely in most countries to also then have a favorable view of Donald Trump. Uh, in Sweden, for example, if you have a favorable view of the Swedish Democrats, you are more likely than everybody else to have a favorable view of Donald Trump. Now, it's still only 28%. Uh, and in France, it, you know, only 39% of those who have a favorable view of the National Front have a favorable view of Donald Trump. But that's better than the 6% of the rest of the population. So, uh, again, this is probably not surprising, but it does suggest there is some commonality in worldview or some kind of shared uh, perception uh, between the supporters of populist right-wing parties in Europe and uh, the rest of the population vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, Donald Trump. Um, this is interesting because we have data going back to 2002 on favorable views of the U.S. and confidence in the U.S. president in Russia. And look what happened in the last year. You had this dramatic increase in both favorability of the U.S. and confidence in the U.S. president. And in fact, confidence in the U.S. president in Russia is now higher than it's ever been since we started asking this question uh, 16 years ago. Uh, now, ca I'll caution you that we were in the field in March and April in uh, Russia. It's conceivable some of these numbers may have changed a little bit because tensions have increased in the relationship. We just don't know. Uh, but that's a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic increase uh, in, in one year. No, it's, like, it's basically a five-fold increase in confidence in the U.S. president and the Russian population in one year. Um, Europeans don't agree with some of the signature policies of the Trump administration. It probably doesn't come as a surprise to you. 93% uh, of Swedes disapprove of President Trump getting the United States out of the um, Paris Climate Accord. Now, we asked this question before the United States actually withdrew. So um, who knows what impact that would have had a, had a public opinion in Sweden when we actually did withdraw. It does, you can't get much higher than 93%, though. So, but still, um, uh, it's conceivable it was wor it's now worse. Um, uh, but basically, 86% of Europeans uh, disapprove of uh, that uh, Trump administration policy. 77% uh, of Europeans oppose the Trump administration's uh, Proposals to withdraw from major U.S. trade agreements, uh, including 90% of Swedes. Uh, so you overwhelmingly disapprove of that policy. Um, we uh, know in public opinion that stereotypes uh, are an interesting way to try to understand how, why people like or dislike certain leaders. Now, I would be the first to acknowledge to you that stereotypes are stereotypes, right? They're just, they aren't necessarily rational, they're emotional. Uh, but let's face it, most people operate on a very high level of emotion when they're thinking about politics. And uh, so we periodically ask in America and around the world about various leaders and about how, what people's stereotypes are of them. Um, we ask people, do you think that President Trump is a strong leader? Uh, the Italians, the Poles, and the Hungarians more or less think he is a strong leader. Uh, only 41% of the Swedes think he's a strong leader. Um, notice that 67% of the Russians think he's a strong leader. Um, we ask people, do you think he's charismatic? Uh, for the most part, most Europeans don't think he's charismatic. Uh, the Hungarians do. Uh, the Poles do to a certain extent. Uh, certainly uh, only four in 10 Swedes do. Uh, but six in 10 Russians do think he's charismatic. 
Do you think he's well qualified to be president of the United States? Only 10% of Swedes believe that. 62% uh, of the Russians do, however. Uh, but notice that almost no Europeans think he's qualified to be president. Uh, does he care about ordinary people? This We ask this because, at least in the American context, this is often a very telling question in political polling. Do you think he cares about people like me? And uh, notice that almost nobody in Europe believes he cares about ordinary people. The Russians do. So you got this real difference. You, this helps explain why the Russians like him, because they basically think he's a strong leader and he's charismatic and he's well qualified and he cares about ordinary people, even though most people in the European Union don't believe that. Um, and then we ask people, do you think he's arrogant? 93% uh, of Swedes think he's arrogant. Uh, notice the Russians don't think he's arrogant. Uh, is he intolerant? 81% of Swedes think he's intolerant. Uh, is he dangerous? 74% of Swedes think he's dangerous. Um, and um, notice again, the Russians don't think he's arrogant, don't think he's intolerant, don't think he's dangerous, and most Europeans do. So there is this, this helps explain, it seems to me, this difference um, between the Russians and other Europeans in terms of the views of, of President Trump. I can tell you Americans tend to believe he's arrogant and intolerant as well. And Americans don't believe he's qualified to be president. More of them, though, believe he's a strong leader. So there is some difference of opinion among Americans as well. What's interesting in transatlantic relations is after Europeans have told us that they don't believe, they have less faith now in the United States than they have in years. They have almost no confidence in the U.S. president. But when we ask them then, do you worry that under Donald Trump, over the next few years, relations between our country and the U.S. will get worse or get better or stay the same, for the most part, people think they're going to stay the same. So they're telling us we don't necessarily think this matters that much uh, in terms of the transatlantic relationship. Now, the Swedes are divided on this. 49% say it's, 49 say it's, it, it's going to stay the same. 48% say it's going to get worse. Only 2% say it's going to get better. Uh, and only the Germans are, are among Europeans, are, only in Germany do you have a majority who say it's going to get, things are going to get worse. Um, but this would suggest that, you know, we, we have to be careful about hyperventilating about favorability of the U.S. or lack of confidence in the U.S. president because the public, for the most part, doesn't necessarily think things, it's going to make things worse. It'll be interesting to ask this question after four years. Did, did in fact, things get worse or did they get better? I mean, that, that, we, we just don't know yet. Um, uh, one of the much vaunted um, um, attributes of the United States, at least in the eyes of Americans, is that we have this soft power. And everybody loves our soft power. And as Joe Nye says of Harvard, you know, this is one of our strengths, et cetera, et cetera. My cautionary note to Joe, who's a friend of mine, is don't oversell this concept. <laughs> because at least in transatlantic relations, it's not at all clear that our soft power is that much of an attribute for us in many European uh, uh, countries. Soft power is a difficult thing to get your hands around. What do we mean by soft power? I mean, I can tell you off the bat, if you mean the export of American cultural products like movies and television and music, everybody everywhere around the world loves America, that aspect of American soft power. That is truly one of our selling points. Other stuff, uh, it's not so clear. For example, we ask people every year, do you think that the United States respects the personal freedoms of its own people? Well, for years, this looked like an aspect of our soft power, right? Three quarters of, of people around the world in 2013 said, yes, America defends the, the personal freedoms of its own, protects the personal freedoms of its own people. You know, that says a lot about America, right? Only 50% of the, of the, uh, of the uh, public in Europe says that today. Uh, why is that? Why has there been this, this dramatic drop and it hasn't changed? Well, the year it dropped was right after the NSA scandal. 
you know, the spying on, on people. It was followed by Ferguson and other, you know, police shootings and, and kind of allegations, at least, uh, that black lives didn't matter in the United States. And it, it would appear to have hurt our aspect of our, that aspect of our soft power and the perception by Europeans of that aspect of our soft power. So these things can get hurt by, by events. Um, we ask people all over the world periodically, uh, do you think uh, American ideas and customs spreading in your country are a good thing or a bad thing for your country? Now, I will tell you, since I wrote this question, I know what we, we were trying to get it. We didn't want to ask people, do you think Amer the Americanization of your country is a good thing? Because frankly, I don't think anybody would have said that yes to that question. Basically because it's a loaded question. But we are trying to get at the concept of Americanization. And, and this was our, you know, maybe good or bad attempt to do that. But as you can see, whereas in some parts of Africa, for example, people say, oh yeah, this is great. The spread of American ideas and customs is a wonderful thing. Um, the median of 52% in Europe say, no, it's a bad thing that, that there's been a spread of American ideas and customs. Now, one of the limitations of survey research is every respondent, everybody you talk to is going to have a different idea of what American ideas and customs are, right? Is that eating hot dogs? Is it, you know, liking baseball? Is it rock and roll? I mean, we, we don't know what that means, but, um, the, the concept of American ideas and customs spreading in my country, you know, the Swedes are divided down the middle on it. And so, I, again, is American soft power as much as it's wanted to be? I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, and I can tell you this has been the case on this question for years now. Um, we ask people about the spread of American ideas of democracy. I can tell you this number's gotten worse. Um, there was a lot of doubt about American ideas about democracy in 2002. There's even in Europe. There's even more now. Uh, again, limitations of survey research. Don't know what the respondent was thinking when they you ask them the question. Are they thinking about the last election and they didn't like the, the product of that election and so they don't like the idea? You know, if the American democracy produced this outcome, I'm against it. Do they know something about how we conduct our elections and they don't think that's good? Uh, or is it simply that, you know, this sense I would say that many Americans have, which is, you know, we are the kind of, you know, guiding light of democracy in the world, and there's only the best way of doing democracy is the way America does a democracy is just not shared by a lot of Europeans. That you have your own ideas about democracy and you like them very much, thank you. <laughs> and uh, that would be certainly the case in Sweden where... 56% of America, uh, Swedes don't like American ideas about democracy. Um, and, um, you know, again, I think this is actually more of a lesson for us than it is for you. It, we, we should take this in and realize that, that uh, our soft power is not necessarily as attractive as we might have thought. Um, uh, as I said before, even though 75% of, of, of Americans have a favorable view of the EU, when you ask, this was done by the Eurobarometer just recently, when you ask them about the main assets of the EU, people don't see the EU having many assets. I mean, I think this is basically, they don't, they don't know, what the, they don't know about, much about the EU. Um, so they, don't, they can't identify uh, strong uh, aspects of the EU. Um, and when we ask Americans, uh, is the influence of the EU currently weaker or stronger than other uh, major powers in the world, uh, notice that basically uh, Americans believe the EU is weaker than the US, it's weaker than China. And while they are likely to 46% of plurality say they're stronger than Japan, it's not a majority. So there's not this sense of the EU as, even though we like the EU, there's not this sense of we respect it very much, to be quite honest. Um, so the, to, I'll close with, though, the real question is, does this matter? You know, it, does this kind of lack of favorability of the U.S. and you know, lack of confidence in the U.S. president, is there evidence in the public opinion data that it 
matters on, on issues. And I think the test case for the beginning of the Trump administration is candidate Trump and initially President Trump, although he's now changed his tune a little bit, was highly critical of NATO. And so the question is, has that affected people's views of NATO and NATO-related issues? Um, uh, and it just so happens in 2015, we asked these questions. So in 2017, when we asked them, we could compare pre-Trump to post-Trump. Um, and as you can see, actually, the view of NATO has actually improved in a lot of countries since Trump was elected. Uh, it's up 13 points in the U.S. Well, you would have thought if you had a candidate and then the president who was kind of beating on NATO, maybe the favorability would have gone down, but it's actually gone up. Um, and um, uh, we only ask these questions, by the way, in, in, in both years in NATO countries. That's why I don't have the Swedish data here. And um, um, I know you're still debating whether you're going to join NATO. <laughs> but... Um, uh, as you can see, there doesn't seem to have been much of an impact of the anti-NATO rhetoric on the image of NATO uh, in the NATO member countries that we've surveyed. Um, another, but one of the questions you should understand about American opinions about NATO is it's highly partisan. And this is something we can get into in the, uh, the Q&A if you want to. Those of you who are observers of the United States might, to a certain extent, in the back of your head think, okay, we understand there's a partisan difference in the United States between the opinions of Republicans and the opinions of Democrats. Let me tell you, as bad as the partisan divide is you think is in the United States, it's worse. <laughs> I can tell you it is worse and it's gotten worse. We are divided on almost everything, including in views of NATO. So. The pounding that NATO got from the Republican candidate for president and from the, at least in the early months of the Republican president, may have had some impact on Republicans' views of NATO. They've fallen from 52% in, in 2015 to 47% today. Now, that's, a, um, that's on the margins of being a statistically significant difference. I wouldn't want to make too much of it. But the point is, Democrats feel better about NATO now. Now, it may be they feel better about NATO because the guy they didn't, didn't vote for was attacking it, so now they feel good about it. We don't know why, but you've got a 29% a percentage point difference, partisan difference in the United States on views of NATO. That's, that's a hugely statistically significant difference on a partisan basis. Um, we ask in 2015 and today... Uh, about Article 5 obligations, would you be willing to go to the defense of a NATO ally if they were attacked by Russia? Bear in mind that every NATO nation is signed on to this. 53% of the Germans would not go to the defense of a NATO ally if they were attacked by Russia. Um, the U.S. would. So Trump's attacks on NATO don't, think, don't seem to have had much impact on um, uh, willingness to uh, defend a NATO ally. And to point out that, I mean, 50, in 2015, 56% of Americans said they'd come to the defense of a NATO ally if they were attacked by Russia. Today, 62% say that. So it's actually gone up in terms of, of willingness to do that. Um, uh, notice that our dear friends, the Germans, still only 40% would go to the defense of a NATO ally if they were attacked by Russia. Um, uh, but, uh, again, there's not a whole lot of evidence that, um, uh, the Trump's, uh, attacks on NATO have had any real impact on people's willingness to live up to their NATO obligations. But the most interesting, uh, result I think is that we ask people, uh, in, uh, NATO member countries, do you believe the United States would come to your aid if you were attacked by Russia? So, I mean, this is, goes to the core of the, the president's questioning of NATO. And as you can see, there really isn't not much of a, I mean, three or four percentage point differences are not statistically significant. Um, there doesn't seem to have been much of an impact on people's belief that the U.S. would come to our aid 
based on the fact that the president has been attacking NATO and questioning our contribution and, you know, should we really defend these people? Um, so, again, I think one of the interesting things to come out of this survey is, yes, there's been a dramatic shift in favorability of the United States in Europe. Yes, there's been a, a collapse in confidence in the U.S. president. Yes, there's opposition to th that president's policies, and there are a lot of sentiment uh, that he's not qualified, that he's dangerous, etc. But there's not a whole lot of evidence that, ha that this has then impacted on real issues that affect the relationship. In other words, things like NATO and the willingness to go to each other's defense. Uh, if And um, uh, we'll have to see. But basically, Europeans don't believe that this is going to make the relationship worse. Again, it's the beginning of the of, of, an, of an administration, not the end. But it, but again, I think even though this public opinion data is fascinating, and maybe for some of you it's troubling, but there's not a whole lot of evidence that it has harmed the relationship yet. I say yet because we don't know. I mean, we'll ask some of these questions again in a year or two, and we'll we'll see what's happened. But I think that's one of the things that we should take away. All of this data, as I said, is available on our website. All of it is uh, free, but most importantly, it's searchable, and there are a lot of trends there. Uh, so you may find that interesting if you uh, uh, want to pursue this further. Thank you. Oops. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, it's, uh, again... I'm not sure if, it, if what you are presenting is fact, but it's certainly interesting. Um, three reflections. One is, you know, what is America and how do we perceive you guys? One is the government, Trump, and one is the country. And when you ask these questions, what would the responders be saying? You know, who are they thinking about? The country yeah. or the government? Yeah. That's one thing. Well, we'll just to answer that question, by the way, we do ask Europeans, how do you feel about Americans? And we've asked that every year. And frankly, you love us, you know, and you've always loved us and you continue us to love us, even if you don't like our president or you don't like our policy. So I'd like to thank you very much. <laughs> the, second out, the second point is when you show Hungary and Poland there it strikes at the core of Europe. Yeah. And we need to think about what that means for us internally. Yeah. And you're picking this up from your angle, but it speaks to us from ours. Uh, third point uh, about uh, the differences within America in relation to how you look at NATO mm -hmm. and how we look at NATO. I think that there is no question that we know that NATO is part of the fundamentals of security. But what that means in terms of responding to current issues mm -hmm. is a very different thing. And that mixes up with uh, the kind of responses you have on what we want, because it doesn't really lead to a conclusion. That is an open debate. So, thank you, Bruce. Uh, we have Jan Hallenberg. Um, Jan is our uh, lead um, research professor here at um, the Institute. You have a long background, Jan, with the United States and analyzing um, where the country goes in our relations. And please, what are your reactions? Well, uh, let me first say that uh, when I write my papers, and I write those papers mostly for the Defense Department these days, I do look at the PU research. Uh, for instance, like the US image suffers around. A lot of interesting stuff on the. Let me look at these issues slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Let me, I 
I've been um, working on transatlantic security relations at the, at the Defense College, now the Defense University, for some 10 years. So, reflect upon those questions, I'd be happy. If not, I'll, I'll leave them hanging. To what an extent are the changes in policy and Atlantic alliance mm -hmm. really only verbal statements by, by Trump? To what an extent are they followed up um, in other policies? on the ground. I mean, that, that, that is a big question. It's clear that the rhetoric coming from the White House is very different. And there are changes, I think, in the extent to which the other NATO countries are spending their increasing the military expenditures. But to what an extent are there other changes? That's one of my questions. <clears throat> Another question um, is... To what an extent do you think that these, particularly these early statements by the president, really hurt the transatlantic? Is this a, a, an early wind that will blow over, or will there be true negative effects on transatlantic relations with three, three and a half years? That's a very difficult question to answer, but... And what does the unpopularity of Mr. Trump in Europe, as you just illustrated, what does it mean for transatlantic security? What does it mean for the United States and its ability to interact with other European it comes to trade, it comes to security matters? And, and one important question, I think, what role does the president see for Germany in this context? Does he understand the crucial role of Germany for European affairs and thus for transatlantic? <coughs> or does he think that Poland can respond the, uh, the Germany on this case? The Poles probably believe that. <laughs> um, yes, these are the questions. So yeah. the, the question is, I, is, are these verbal statements were merely moving on the, on the top of the sea. Changes. Yeah. Really that's my question to you. Well, I, you know, the, I think that's the core issue, and, and that's why I tried to end with saying, you know, there's no real evidence in public opinion that the rhetoric has had much impact. Um, uh, you know, we, I think you're right that there's been a lot of statements by uh, the president but little substantive policy actions that adversely affect the transatlantic relationship. Uh, yes, it's true that they haven't picked up on TTIP, but TTIP was in the deep freezer before, before Trump became president. Uh, there's no movement to resurrect it, so uh, you can interpret that however you want to. But, you know, frankly, the initial problems or primary problems, at least at put TTIP in the deep freezer, where the fact that Europeans couldn't get their act together and, and support it, it wasn't really an issue of debate in the United States yet. It, it may have turned negative in the United States that there had been a debate, but there certainly wasn't enough of a debate to even know. And our survey showed that, in principle, people liked the idea. But frankly, we'd never, we hadn't had any public debate about it yet, the way you've had a public debate for a couple of years. Um, yeah, on NATO, it, it, you know, the president had finally came out and said, you know, we would stand by our Article 5 commitments, you know, which took a long time for that statement to come out, but it did. Um, uh, you know, it's been a long-standing policy of the U.S. government going back a number of administrations that we want the Europeans to spend 2% on defense. The Europeans began to move towards those targets before Trump was elected. Um, uh, they continue to move forward. Are they being nudged along by Trump's rhetoric? Maybe. I don't know. You would know better than I would. But, you know, it's not like people are backtracking. Um, in terms of uh, tests, I mean, certainly the U.S. pulling out of the climate change agreement was an action that was promised by candidate Trump, and he did it. And it's hugely unpopular in Europe. Um, so that is one you know, tangible thing uh, that happened that has, it would appear, contributed to people's 
negative attitudes about the U.S. or about Trump. Um, we know from our survey data that Europeans don't want the U.S. to pull out of the Iran agreement. Uh, this month, the administration, the U.S. administration has to recertify that Iran has, is continuing to live up to the, uh, its commitments. Uh, we know that the UN, U.S. U.N. ambassador, uh, Haley, uh, has said that they aren't living up to it. And when pressed on that issue, she cites things that aren't on the agreement. <laughs> you know, living up to the spirit of the agreement, not the fact of the agreement. Well, I can tell you, having talked to very senior European officials, and as an aside, as a confession, my wife was the chief negotiator from the American side of the Iran agreement, so I have a personal stake in this agreement. Take So what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but... Senior European officials, uh, I think, would be terribly upset if the U.S. pulls out of the, of the Iran agreement. So that could be, if, if we do that, and we haven't done it yet, um, but there's certainly very strong threats that we will, um, that could be, and we know the public in Europe, from our public opinion survey, say the public doesn't want the U.S. to pull out. Uh, that could be an, an action that would actually have some adverse uh, impact, but again, it's at this point still rhetoric, not not action. Um, uh, I think what the the long term implications of these things are, it's hard to judge. Um, there was this dramatic decline in favorability of the U.S. and confidence in the U.S. president under uh, uh, George Bush, George W. Bush. It kind of went down and down and down. Uh, did the adverse public sentiment in Germany uh, uh, encourage or at least sustain Gerhard Schroeder's unwillingness to help us in the Iraq war? I don't know. We'd have to ask Gerhard Schroeder, but certainly not going along with the U.S. on the Iraq war had certain support among the German public. Um, uh, we know that the Turkish parliament wouldn't approve allowing the U.S. to invade Iraq from the north. Uh, and we knew from our surveys that the Turkish public was pretty negative about George Bush and about the U.S. by that point. Was that a contribution to that? I don't know. But, you know, certainly, uh, and that's separate from whether we should or shouldn't have invaded Iraq, but there, there may have been a, an impact there. Um, I know when I showed this data to senior officials in Berlin, both the SPD and CDU senior officials, they to a person, and this were four different people in different briefings, said, oh, Martin Schultz is going to ramp up his anti-American you know, uh, rhetoric during the campaign. Now, I don't think he has, actually. But they all got it, that this had political import in, in the German election. Um, so again, I think we have to be cognizant of, of, of that. Um, and uh, so in principle, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that it has a prolonged damning effect on transatlantic relations. I mean, look what happened when Obama was elected. I mean, mood in Europe just changed overnight. Uh, and then when Trump was elected, mood changed again overnight. One might worry about the volatility of this in a relationship, um, you know, because clearly the data is very clear that this is really volatile, and it's actually a volatility that you generally don't see in public opinion. You know, you see marginal changes. You don't see 83 percentage point drops in one year, which is what you saw in Sweden. But um, Bruce, yeah, I'm not sure if I am overinterpreting your data but, and the drama that yeah. you are showing there. But might it be the case that despite the numbers going up and down, there is something there that is showing, um, signifying the stability of transatlantic relations. Mm -hmm. You see the consequences of a Trump rhetoric but the shift in views, 
perversely almost, show that what we want is a strong relationship. And that the reactions are actually reflecting mm -hmm. the worry that yeah. the U.S. is stepping out of what we feel is fundamental. Well, I mean, I, you're right. I actually hadn't thought about it this way, but you're right. I mean, one of the interpretations could be that you care a lot. <laughs> and, you know, what's important in a relationship is that the other party cares. You know, you may not agree, but, but what would be... Um, one could argue what would be worse for the relationship if you said, I don't care who you elect president because I don't really care about you. And, and this is a sign that people care deeply about the United States, worry deeply about the implications of some of the changes in the United States. Um, um, and um, I don't know how you'd measure this in public opinion, but one of the interesting questions would be, could you get to a point where people say, we don't care what you do? And that would be a sign of a change in the perception of the role of the United States in the world. So I think that what we see is partly we care. Yeah. And then partly we see some countries who have a different attitude, Russia and a few others of the countries that you mentioned, who think differently about what is important. Yeah, no, I agree. That is partly a transatlantic relationship, but it is partly what the European Union is about. Mm -hmm. And being from the outside, you, yeah. you are revealing some of our own internal issues to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let uh, us uh, ask the audience uh, who would like to uh, uh, speak. Uh, please, over there. Thank you, Orsa Smendler. I would like to um, uh, think in, in one part more. You are reflecting the difference of opinion between US and the EU. And over the past, uh, uh, well, since World War II, this has been a very close relationship. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning of this century, we had eight years of very low appreciation of the leader of your country. Now we're back again. Yeah. This, together with something which the Europeans are uh, um, uh, appreciating very much, the climate change agreement, dropping out of that. Uh, and on the other side, uh, somebody picking up the torch, which is China. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That makes me think that if you had also measured, though it's a se sequence of things, uh, how uh, uh, the relation, not only in terms of people's uh, uh, ages and their opinion, but how would it look if uh, the relation between the three issues, Asia, uh, mainly uh, China, Europe, and uh, the US? Because we, we have a situation with a dramatic drop, but it, it could be underlying factors that uh, will turn out to well, be Well, actually, in, in that... Uh, um report that is, uh, and, and data that's on our website, we actually ask people about the favorability of China uh, in Europe. And in fact, it's improved in a number of countries. Now, it's been volatile. It's gone up and down. Um, but, uh, and what you don't know is that even though you ask people just about China, say, in that question, you don't ask them compared to the United States because you ask separately about the United States. So it's not like they have to pick one or the other. Some of them may be thinking that, right? That, okay, I don't feel so good about the U.S. and I now feel better about China, you know? Now, why is that? I mean, already Europeans believe that the Chinese economy is uh, the global hegemonic economy, not the United States. Well, in fact, that's ac not accurate. I mean, yeah, but, but, but Europeans already believe that China is the world's leading economic power, not the United States. Um, uh, so, you, I do think you're right. I think that increasingly, and one of the reasons we, we do this is, you know, it's, it's the U.S. relative to what? And, and, and things seem to be uh, improving in, in Europe in terms of the views of China. Now, 
you know better than I do that this is getting more complex in the European, in European Union as well. I mean, for one thing, you don't have to worry about Chinese military power. We do. <laughs> you know, you don't have a navy in the, in the South China Sea. We do. So it's easier for you just to worry about one aspect of China, not multiple aspects. Also, though, you are seeing a dramatic increase in Chinese investment in Europe. Uh, Volvo being a perfect example, but there's others, you know, and it, there's some evidence that more Europeans are beginning to pay attention to this and kind of question this. It was, a, you know, an unadulterated good. Chinese come, they bail out our companies. Chinese come, create their own kind. This is what's wrong with this. But there's rising questions, for example, in Germany about this, because what they're buying is maybe something they don't want to sell. And I think that uh, that could become a more complicated issue for Europe in relationship to China, just as it's becoming more of a complicated issue for the United States. Um, and it's probably only going to get more complicated because as more and more Europeans work for Chinese companies and more and more Americans work for Chinese companies, that means more and more European voters work for Chinese companies, more and more American voters work for Chinese companies. And the relationship between our countries our two countries and, and China are going to be affected by that politics as a result. And I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. I just think it's real. Uh, I mean, to give you a practical example of how that works in a different context, when the Japanese invested initially in the United States, this was highly controversial. But then they created a lot of jobs and wasn't this great, and it's not controversial anymore. Well, in 2009, when the U.S. government decided we need to bail out General Motors and Ford and Chrysler because of the economic crisis, the leading opposition in the U.S. Senate to that bailout was the senator from Nissan, the lead senator from Tennessee. Nissan has its plant in Tennessee. A lot of his voters work for a Japanese company that wasn't going to get any bailout. And he finally changed his opinion because he became to understand that, you know, the, if General Motors failed, then all the suppliers would fail. If the suppliers failed, then Nissan wouldn't have any parts and Nissan would fail. But the point being that foreign investment by other countries begins to affect policy decisions down the line in those countries. And we can think that's good or bad. I mean, that's a different issue, but I think it's, it is, uh, going to become more and more of an issue as people it begins to dawn on people that there are implications of all this foreign investment. John. Yes, during the Obama years, we heard a lot about the pivot. Yeah. The United States was yeah. moving away from the transatlantic alliance and toward yeah. Asia. Is that still happening? And if not, why not? Well, um, you know, in public opinion terms, it hasn't happened. We still think Europe's more important than Asia, except young people think Asia's already more important than <laughs> um, so this is going to, the pivot's going to happen in public opinion. It just may take longer. Uh, you know, we, the, the Trump administration pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So that aspect, the economic aspect of the pivot in the sense of the kind of demonstrable aspect. That was is, a big is, mistake. Has, has, uh, has not happened. You know, we have to wait and see because, you know, the Trump administration has made noises about a free trade agreement with the Japanese. Japanese are a little bit resistant to this, but, you know, I mean, maybe five years from now, we'll look at this differently. Um, but certainly the, the military commitment of the United States was always there and is still there. We asked people in our most recent survey, would you go to the defense of, a, of an Asian ally if they were attacked by China? Yes. Would you go to the defense of an Asian ally if they were attacked by North Korea? Yes. So that aspect of the pivot was always there and remains. Uh, but certainly the perception in Asia among elites, at least that you talk to, is that, whoa, you know, the U.S. is turning its back on us. I don't know that that's, like I say, not factually necessarily true. Um, and we don't know from public opinion data whether the public now believes that the U.S. is pulling back. But I think it's a question we need to ask people. But again, it... It's, it's the difference between rhetoric and reality. Um, and um, Bruce, uh, yeah. you know that, I mean, your series 
of statistics show this deep bond between Europe and certainly Sweden and, and the United States. Uh, now we are being tested because your leadership is problematic in the eyes of Swedes, as you demonstrated. At some point, you know, when there is unrequited love, there will be a reaction. What would you like to say just <laughs> to us, how we should act? We have our own issues within the European Union. We don't feel that we have any impact on the politics in the United States, yet we are bound by destiny somehow. So, uh, remember that Ronald Reagan said with relationship to Russia, trust but verify. <laughs> and that gets, I think, back to the point is that, you know, continue to trust us, but, you know, it, you know the proof is in the pudding. The, what, it, you know, what, it, what is actually happens in the relationship. Um, and we do know that European public opinion can be, uh, I would dare say, and this is my own opinion, but I think the data proves it, uh, can be unrealistic about America and unrealistically romantic about America. I mean, what happened in 2009 when we elected Barack Obama as president, uh, one, there was this incredibly surge in, in, in confidence in the U.S. president compared to Bush. But we asked follow-up questions of people. So what do you expect of this new guy who's going to be president? And Europeans across the board said, oh, he's going to end the economic crisis. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. He's going to stop global warming. And we said, really? <laughs> Have you people ever heard of the U.S. Congress? <laughs> you know, these are complex issues. And uh, people had, you know, they so wanted these things to happen. They invested in the U.S. president all of this ability to make the stuff happen that they wanted to have see happen. And, and so I think, at least from that set of data, one of the lessons is, you know, don't, don't overestimate what the American, thank you very much that you trust us that much, but don't overestimate our ability to do things. And maybe don't underestimate now the, the, uh, uh, the ability of the U.S. to get things done. Uh, until at least we prove to you that we don't, can't. And, you know, look, you obviously disagree with happen, what happened around the Paris Peace Climate Change Accord. You say you'll disagree with us if we pull out of Iran. You say you disagree with us on pulling out of trade agreements. Um, but let's see how what, what transpires, really, um, before you, you pass ultimate judgment on us. Transatlantic turbulence, we certainly will engage in this dialogue. The hour is over. I thank you for coming. I thank you, Bruce, for bringing the thank statistics. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, log on to Pew and let's give uh, Bruce a big uh, applause. <laughs>